Welcome, Steve Davis, professor, rock and roll professor, Kingwood College, and he's going to do a little something different today. We're going to look into JFK's assassination and some interesting thoughts and bibliographies. And Steve, welcome. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your take on things. Okay, well, let's do it. And uh, there's the date and the difference of the... Steve, you hear me? Today. I can. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yes. Hello? And I'm going to mute myself. So everybody mute yourself. State. When I, when I teach the class, I don't have students who remember when it happened and where they were, were and the like. But that's not true for many of us here for exactly where we were uh, because it was such a marker in our lives and in the history of this country. And I think rightly could be called the crime now of the last century, the Kennedy assassination. So let's just go over the bare bones about what uh, President Kennedy was doing in Dallas on that uh, Friday that uh, that this terrible thing happened. He had come to Texas on a, a political visit, a two day trip, Thursday and Friday in late November of 1963. And uh, obviously by then was uh, thinking about the reelection campaign. I put this map up here for 19. That's what it says more than anything is how close the election was. He barely beat Richard Nixon in the vote and in the Electoral College. And that was with LBJ, a Texan on the ticket as his as his running mate. So he was very concerned. Texas is always important. It's now in terms of the number of electoral votes. So we needed to make a trip to Texas to get a lot of popular audiences, to do some fundraising, to get great press coverage and all that. Houston that Thursday night. He made an appearance at the Rice Hotel downtown. And then uh, the uh, the entourage flew from there to Fort Worth, spent the night in a hotel in Fort Worth, and uh, got up the next morning and gave a breakfast talk. And then a little bit later in the morning, they flew from Fort Worth to Dallas Love Field. Now, there's a famous headline in the Dallas Morning News, Storm of Political Country, because uh, Texas was back then, you see the reference to split state party. Texas back then was a state. The Democratic Party had been dominant for a long time. So what happened in terms of political contention was an ongoing fight between the liberal and conservative wings of the Democratic Party. And frankly, what President Kennedy needed to do was to come to Texas and knock some heads together, knowing that if they kept uh, at each other this way, that that would be a detriment to his being able to win Texas uh, the following November. So it all looks kind of petty in retrospect that there was all this political backbiting and the like. So there's the headline there. Uh, from earlier that day, uh, the Dallas Morning News. And uh, so the president uh, uh, made that speech in uh, Fort Worth and they flew to Dallas Love Field, which would, of course is very close from Fort Worth to Dallas, but that would give the opportunity uh, as Air Force One landed there to have another um, appearance. It was to get uh, into a motorcade and go through downtown Dallas. And it was time so that this would happen during the lunch hour be able to go out to the street to see President's uh, motorcade. This is, of course, not an everyday experience we have to see the president of the country. And uh, this uh, picture captures something. It was a beautiful rain or drizzle. And they were very pleased that morning when they got up and found that the weather actually was very sunny. You can see the uh, see Mrs. Kennedy there kind of squinting into the sun. The bubble top was not bulletproof, but uh, almost certainly had uh, the weather been bad and the bubble top uh, uh, had it been in use, the president uh, died uh, as a result of what happened. So anyway, this is at some point, uh, you know, just a few minutes before the world took a very, very terrible turn. And um, the motorcade route was through uh, uh, downtown Dallas. And this picture here is to the side of the assembly is very much toward the end of the motorcade uh, route, the motorcade would have come, let me see if I can move the cursor here, from somewhere this direction and made this right-hand turn onto Houston Street and then what's called a hairpin because of the angle there, the hairpin turn onto Elm Street. And because of the severity of that angle, then it would mean it would slow way down to something like maybe just 15 miles an hour and that certainly plays a role. So pay attention to the building that becomes so notorious right here on the corner stands for the School Book 
depository building, the Texas School Book Depository building, especially to the to the sixth floor, to the corner window on the sixth floor, and what uh, what is about to take place. Um, this particular area here downtown. features that become famous that's that grassy area there in the grassy knoll and it figures into a lot of the theories as to what happened and notice this structure right here and you see there's a reference to zapruder and so let's go to the next slide now and this is a photograph i took of my colleague professor john barr and uh, we went there in november of 2017 um you all probably aren't as aware of the timing as we would be because Hurricane Harvey had destroyed our campus just a couple of months prior. So we were really glad to be able to go to a conference because you know we couldn't go to school, we couldn't see our colleagues, we had to shift to online teaching. So and again, roughly that same time of the year. Now, what strikes me about this picture here, a couple of things. As you notice here, that's that structure I was pointing to in Dealey Plaza. You can see some jagged edges on the fence right behind. That's this picket fence that's that's labeled right here. Same fence is still there today. Uh, and it, and Abraham Zapruder was a local businessman. He owned a dress factory, which was just a few blocks away. And he very much admired President Kennedy, and he had given the employees the the uh, lunch hour off to go see the uh, motorcade. And he was standing on top of this piece right here. That's where Zapruder was. And he was a he was a home film buff. He was a camera buff and he had the latest model Bell and Howard. In American history, it's called a Zapruder film and he was an eyewitness to the assassination. Now, we were talking about Sarah, Sarah Val earlier and one thing Sarah Val really uh, stresses in her works uh, as a popular historian uh, is to go to the actual site where things happen because you can learn so much more from being at the location. And one of the things it told me was given how close that defense is, Pruder was, had there been someone firing a rifle from behind that fence, it, it would have deafened him. There's no way he could have held that camera still. I think he would have jumped out of his skin. And so that helped to, to me to refute some of the ideas as to the direction of the of the fatal shot, especially. But anyway, the motorcade was winding through Dealey Plaza. Here is the from the Zapruder film itself. Uh, the motorcade has made the turn onto Elm Street. This is a literal nightmare on Elm Street that's going to take place. At this point, everything is still fine. And uh, the the uh, the school book depository building would be somewhere back up and in this direction here. The motorcade's preceding. Notice the sign here. That's a freeway sign that will block the view of Zapruder. There's a moment when the when the president's limousine is is out of sight, but then when it emerges on the other side, and the Zapruder film has been broken down frame by frame, something like 14 frames per second, and clearly on the other side of the sign, something terrible has happened. President Kennedy has been hit. We know now he was shot uh, in the upper part of his back. The bullet went through his throat and exited his neck and his his tie. There's a, a nick in his tie where the bullet where the bullet uh, went through. And we can see that Texas Governor John Connolly reacting. He's been wounded. Now uh, the allegation is, and I think it's actually correct. It was the same bullet. It it passed through. President Kennedy, it tumbled and went into uh, Governor Connolly and severely wounded. This is very definitely a riot. At this point, President Kennedy has been hit, but that was a survivable wound. So let me skip ahead now to notorious Zapruder frame number 312. And the president now is kind of falling over and missing. You see, uh, uh, and his wife is reacting to his uh, his obvious uh, distress. And I save it right there, guys, because if I were to show you Zapruder frame number 313, I'm not gonna show it to you for good reason. Ted explodes. Um, and I tell my students, you know, if you guys wanna go online and watch the Zapruder film, feel free, be my guest. I'm not gonna show this in class. Uh, I'm just gonna verbally convey what happened. 
Now, uh, when we first saw it aired in the United States uh, here in the mid-70s, for a long time, the Zapruder film was off limits to the public. It shocked people because what we seem to see, well, what we do see is the president's head when that, that headshot occurs. It goes backward. And that led people to believe the fatal shot must therefore have come from in front, meaning it would not have been uh, from the Texas school book would have been back and up in this direction here. It would have been from here somewhere, possibly the direction of the grassy knoll behind the picket fence. Some who've really broken this down say, when you look at the at the split second, the microsecond of the headshot, the initial movement of the president's head is forward, and then there's the massive movement to the back. And uh, that's something that explains that called the jet effect. And maybe we can, I'll save that for the Q&A, because a lot of people have raised questions about that. When you see the Zapruder film, it leads you, I think, to uh, m maybe necessarily not the correct conclusion. So the president obviously was um, terribly wounded. And uh, this is a famous frame here that Mrs. Kennedy is crawling out onto the back of the limousine, uh, trying to retrieve a piece of her, her, of her husband. I mean, uh, that's, that's the fact of the matter. She's, she's reacting instinctively. And the Secret Service agent named Clint Hill, who's jumping on the back, probably saves her life because by now the Drivers of the of the limousine have realized something is wrong, and they great. And had Mrs. Kennedy uh, gone out totally onto the trunk of the car, there she probably would have fallen off and have been run over uh, by the by the coming vehicles. And imagine um, just the absolute horror of uh, of something like that taking place. So Clint Hill was uh, personally assigned; uh, he was uh, her Secret Service uh, agent. And I'll tell you a story here, guys. That I think is very important in terms of the overall you know, big picture of what happened. It turns out later, the, all this, he had been out drinking until past 2 a.m. that morning, which is not what somebody assigned to the president's detail should have been. And uh, he had a problem. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and uh, but he was young, maybe felt kind of immortal. And uh, so it just raised these questions. You know, were certain of the Secret Service agents really at their mental and physical best? Now he was in good enough shape that he could in the picture here, but it just, I think, shows us just some of the human shortcomings that can be behind something like this. Had they been more alert, maybe they would have seen somebody in one of those windows, as certain bystanders did, but nobody managed to, and uh, the, the president's uh, shooting took place. So the motorcade went to Parkland Hospital. They did all they could to try to save the president, but clearly his his wound was mortal. Abraham Zapruder saw it right there uh, in his camera, and he, he knew when he went back to the office, he was utterly shaken. He said, the president's dead. There's no way he could have survived that. So this is uh, probably no more than an hour and a half later. That would have put this, the shots occurred at 1230. This would have been probably by two o'clock that afternoon. It's aboard Air Force One uh, there on runway in Dallas and President Johnson's being sworn in. Uh, local federal judge Sarah Hughes is uh, administering the oath of office. And Mrs. Kennedy, what we can't see from her, um, her suit that she's wearing is um, what doesn't stand out in this black and white is that it's covered with the president's blood. And uh, she was told that she had a change of clothes. She said, I want the world to see uh, what has happened. And so this was a transition. Occur. At this point, nobody knows who has done this. Maybe it's some kind of an effort. Remember, we're at the height of the Cold War. Maybe somebody's trying some foreign power. It's important to get the the new president sworn in and officially the afternoon. Uh, obviously, we need to get some answers. So President Johnson uh, appoints a blue ribbon commission that's headed by Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, to conduct a thorough investigation over probably uh, most of the next year. This is the so-called Warren Commission, and the Warren Commission. Uh, after all of its interviews, and uh, it finally wrote up uh, its findings, uh, you know, eventually that uh, the the assassin was one lone man. The fellow who's in the photograph here on the left, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was an employee at the Texas School Book Depository Building. This is a photo taken in his backyard by his wife, Marina, and I'll get to the backstory uh, to that in just a bit. They concluded that Oswald was the assassin, and that two days later, 
what we see here in this still photograph. This is, of course, from live television footage. A man named Jack Ruby, a nightclub owner in Dallas, uh, by himself, once again, one lone actor killed Oswald, shot him on live television in the basement of the Dallas jail as he was being transferred from the city jail to the county jail. And they wrote up these findings in this multi-volume report. So Claire asked me to explain why I entitled this um, two cheers for the Warren Commission, not three cheers. I gave this talk at Kingwood some years ago and I used that title. Somebody thought it was a misprint and they changed the title of the three cheers and that's not what I wanted because three cheers implies, oh my God, they did a great job. Well, I don't think the the best possible job. They made some mistakes. Uh, and uh, But it, what I want to say, I say two cheers because here's the controversial part, guys. I said I was going to tell you, you know, who or what was behind the Kennedy assassination. And I believe the Warren Commission got it right. I am convinced that it was one lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, and I believe I know the motive for his killing of President Kennedy. I'm going to explain that in just a bit. But the Warren Commission, of course, um, dissatisfied a lot of people who thought there were all kinds of holes in the, the argumentation and the evidence and the like, and it led to all kinds of conspiracy theories. Probably the best example is this movie by uh, directed by Oliver Stone uh, called uh, JFK that came out in the early 90s. And uh, if you watch JFK, which uh, I will say, I tried to rewatch it a couple of months ago and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get through it. I just thought it was terrible. Uh, Oliver Stone's a great filmmaker, but I, I think it's just, just preposterous. Um, the claims of the movie that practically everybody other than Oswald was involved in the Kennedy assassinations, the CIA and the FBI and the anti-Castro Cubans and organized crime and big business, hell, even Lyndon Johnson, I have to excuse my French guys, he's even got the vice president involved in Secret Service. It was a conspiracy. God knows it would have involved hundreds if not thousands of people, and it just doesn't hold up. And so it, conspiracy theories are out there. I'll just give you one um, criticism of the Warren Commission. Um, did they talk to everybody they should have talked to? Well, no, because one of the witnesses they didn't call was Mrs. Kennedy. And who who was a more firsthand witness than the first lady? She was right there for this uh, terrible crime where they where the killing took place. But Earl Warren, just for humane considerations, felt we don't want to put her through that. We can get at the truth of this without uh, calling Mrs. Kennedy in to testify. And probably in retrospect, that's a mistake because it left the door open to people thinking that some kind of monstrous cover-up was occurring. So here's a still from the movie, um, JFK, and here the uh, New Orleans uh, District Attorney Jim Garrison some years later thinks he knows who conspired to kill the president, and he's uh, got a mock-up here of Dealey Plaza with the School Book Depository Building explaining how the Warren Commission's explanation could not have been correct. So what I want to do is talk about um, what I consider to be the portrait of an assassin in the rest of this presentation. and. Yes, I do believe it was Lee Harvey Oswald who did it. Who was this man? This picture here, I think, captures something. You see the date. It is the day after he is in the custody of the Dallas police. Um, you see the mouse over his, uh, over his left eye. And that's because he resisted arrest and uh, there was a scuffle. And I think the cops probably hit him a couple of times. But I think what it captures, too, is there's a smirk. Uh, this is kind of characteristic of Lee Harvey Oswald. There's a kind of an arrogance that I think this photograph uh, captures here. So who was this man, Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, let me start by saying that he was, he was a Libra. Uh, that's his, uh, his uh, sign of the Zodiac because he was born in October. He was born in New Orleans in October of 99, meaning he had just recently turned 24 at the time of the Kennedy assassination. This book by Don DeLillo, who's one of the great American writers, does put forward a conspiracy theory he has the CIA being mainly behind it. I do recommend the book because it's just such a brilliant character study of Oswald and Jack Ruby and a lot of the others, and uh, even though I don't agree with its, um, its basic thrust. But anyway, he was a Libra. That's the reference that uh, DeLillo is making there in the title. Born in New Orleans in 1939. Now, uh, his, uh, his upbringing was not stable. His uh, dad had died of a heart attack before Lee was even born. His mom, Marguerite Oswald, was a nurse, and, but she didn't make much money. He had an older brother named Robert, and uh, Marguerite and the boys moved around a lot. Um, 
because she didn't, uh, you know, she found it hard to support her family. She was a single mom. It uh, turns out kind of a difficult person herself, but that's neither here nor there in this uh, this particular context. But I skip ahead to talking about there having a kind of an itinerary existence because for a period in the early 1950s, Marguerite and the boys lived in New York City. And it was there in 1953 that Lee said something happened uh, on the street, on the sidewalk that changed the entire course of his life. And uh, he came across a woman who handed him a flyer on the Rosenberg case. Now, the Rosenbergs at that time, they had been arrested in 1950 for atomic espionage. There they are pictured right here, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, New York City couple. They were accused of stealing uh, the secrets of the atomic bomb and passing along to the Russians. And you see the headline of the New York Times, later in 1953, the year that Lee was handed that flyer, they were electrocuted at Sing Sing Penitentiary in New York State. And in the meantime, though, there were people who were convinced that they were framed up. That uh, And you see the signs here, demand justice for the Rosenbergs. It's a frame up, stop this legal murder, this kind of thing. Um, now, uh, what is there behind this? Well, I want to tell you guys, there's been a lot that's been written on the Rosenberg case, and I believe that Julius Rosenberg was guilty. Did that mean he should, and especially his wife, Ethel, who was not nearly as involved, go to the electric chair? No, I would never make the case for that. But they were devoted members of the American Communist Party, which is not, of course, against the law in this country. It's, it's a free country still. And, uh, but anyway, it's not, it's not legal, of course, to spy uh, for our adversaries. And uh, so I think they were guilty. But that's, that's not the point here. The point is that the woman who handed Lee the flyer was advocating on behalf of the Rosenbergs as being innocent. And Lee said that, that the Rosenberg case opened his eyes to the injustice of the American system, to the criminal justice system, and indeed to capitalism itself. So at this point, Lee would have been in his early teens. And he said that was a, an experience that was uh, crucial to his becoming a dedicated Marxist. So Lee, from the time he's in his early teens, is going to have hardline uh, politics, left-wing politics. And indeed, I will argue that Lee Harvey Oswald essentially was a communist himself. By communist, I don't throw around words like that lightly. I don't think we ever should. We should be careful about political labels. But by communist, I don't mean an, uh, an actual member of the American Communist Party, but Lee definitely had those kinds of Marxist-Leninist ideals. So at any rate, uh, after a while, um, Another, uh, they were only in New York a relatively short time. Lee and uh, his mother moved back to New Orleans. And uh, one of the causes he adopted in New Orleans was civil rights because New Orleans was in the deep South and it was a Jim Crow town. And Lee uh, talked about how he would sometimes go and sit in the back of the bus with the black people to show his uh, disdain for the, for the segregation laws. And uh, he stirred up a lot of trouble. You know, white people very much were uh, angered by Lee making a gesture of that kind. So that becomes, and that's a key, I think, to some of Lee's behavior later, that he saw what what this country in its racist um, approach, especially in laws in this period, does to black people, symptomatic of what capitalism does to working people in general. So this only reinforced his Marxist beliefs. Now, having said all that, it might seem kind of shocking, when I tell you that the day Lee turns 17 years old, he joins the United States Marine Corps. So there's Lee pictured right there. And here's uh, this page is some of his uh, Marine Corps, some of the highlights of his Marine Corps record. Does it make any sense? Yeah, I think it actually does. Because uh, Lee uh, came from a very limited uh, background socio soci in socioeconomic terms. And uh, I think the Marine Corps gave him a chance to see some of the world, otherwise that he of his tour of duty in Japan, uh, as is noted here. And it's important to note that he did receive, of course, weapons training. He wasn't at the highest level, which in the Marine Corps is expert, but he did score as a sharpshooter and as a marksman. So he, he had the basics down in terms of using a rifle. And uh, also he had a history of being uh, insubordinate. You see down here, we can read that, and this is in June of 58, he received a summary court-martial for wrongfully using provoking words to a staff NCO at the Bluebird Cafe in Yamato, Japan. And this was typical of Lee, too, to be very disdainful of authority, 
which in a service branch like the Marine Corps could definitely be problematic. And so he was in the Marine Corps, and uh, while he was there, he was assigned to radar that was monitoring the flights of highly secret spy planes called the U-2 that at high altitude were flying from based in Japan were flying over the Soviet Union. So that may have led Lee to think he had some he had some important uh, classified information that the communists that the Russians specifically could be interested in later. It was while Lee was in the Marine Corps that news came of the triumph of the Castro Revolution. You see that Fidel had started his fight against a dictatorial government in Cuba led by Batista in 1952, and uh, it came to power. Uh, here you see the celebration on New Year's Day of 1959. That's Fidel there, of course, with the beard and with the, the rifle upraised. And so Lee was still in the Marines when this uh, this big news came, and his Marine Corps buddies talked about how excited he was given his communist views. Even though Fidel had not revealed himself to be a communist at this stage, that would come a little bit later. Still, it was a revolution, and it was a revolution in Latin America, not very far, just 90 miles from the United States. And that gave Lee hope that uh, this kind of radical revolutionary change in our own backyard could take place. So Lee served out his three-year tour in the Marine Corps, and uh, when, he, when he left the Marine Corps in 1959, uh, he immediately, this is in October of 1959, he defected to the Soviet Union. There's a picture of Lee on the left with a Russian friend that he had made. He's going to live in the Soviet Union for roughly the next two and a half years. And when he went to the Soviet Union, he knew that. Well, he believed, he was a true believer. He really believed that the Soviet Union, this communist country was a worker utopia. He took all of that very seriously. And he believed in a country like the United States Somebody with his views was never going to be allowed by the system to get anywhere, and he wanted to be part of this great uh, experiment in, in communism. So he uh, he did this. He went to Russia with the view of renouncing his citizenship, his U.S. citizenship, because of some bureaucratic snafu. It didn't happen, which turned out to be a fortunate uh, fortunate factor for Lee in the in the time ahead. Now the picture there on the left of Lee with his friend is taken in the Russian city, the Soviet city of Minsk which is in Belarus, which is a country that's in the news right now because they have a dictatorship in the streets uh, up at arms about that. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting that the Russians let him stay there. I mean, I, I think it's not every day that an American who is the next Marine walks into the uh, walks the Russian authorities and says, you know, I'm, I'm on your side and I'll stay here. And you imagine uh, at the height of the Cold War how suspicious they must have been they probably thought, considered that he was a double agent, but they decided to let him stay. Uh, they kind of, I think on one level, they kind of felt sorry for him, but they let him stay. They gave him an apartment and they lined him up with a job in a radio factory in, in the city of Minsk. Uh, the Russians, I think, felt that they had really done very well by Lee. Um, he had an apartment, I have it here in my notes, that measured 266 square feet. Well, that doesn't sound like much to us, but the fact that you had your own small apartment in the Soviet Union where there was always a severe housing shortage and often families, entire families had to share a couple of rooms. They felt that they were treating him in a, in a rather benevolent manner. But it didn't take long for Lee to become dissatisfied because here he was doing manual labor and uh, he had thought that he would uh, immediately be promoted and he would become some kind of, uh, recognized as some kind of leader uh, in what he wanted to have become his new country. And I think also too, Lee was no fool, that Lee, Lee was not stupid by any means. And it didn't take him long to see that the Soviet Union was not a very ideal society, that, that everybody had, except for the elite of the Communist Party, the working people have it very, had it in that country. And it wasn't the utopia it was cracked up to be. So it's not long before he becomes very disillusioned with life in the USSR. Now, along the way, he did meet a young Russian woman. This is in early 1961. He was in this dance. Her name was Marina Prusakova, and there she is pictured on the right. And uh, I forget how 19 or 20 at the time. You know, if you grew up in the United States in the days of the Cold War, uh, her own propaganda always depicted Soviet, Union, Soviet women as being very unattractive uh, because, you know, they had these, the Olympic team. We know now there was a lot of doping taking place. And, they all seem kind of big and masculine, what have you. 
which of course, you know, that's that stereotype is completely unreal. But anyway, Marina was an attractive young woman and they met and they had a, Lee was on the rebound as it turned out. He'd proposed to another Russian woman on uh, New Year's Eve and she turned him down. And I guess you'd need to be careful about being on the rebound. But anyway, he met Marina at a dance and they had a whirlwind romance and they got married on April 30 of 1961. Now, a couple of weeks before their wedding took place, here's the headline of the New York Times. You see that there comes the news of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Anti-Castro units land in Cuba. Uh, and by now, what I really need to underscore from what I said earlier about the Cuban Revolution and Fidel coming to power is Lee found this incredibly hopeful that whereas in the Soviet Union, he could see that that, that communist revolution had degenerated, that it had become very, very conservative and the ideals were now were largely ignored. He thought that in Cuba, this was a fresh beginning, that the revolution was young and new, and this is where the real progress would be taking place. So here came the news that President Kennedy, in his first 100 days in the White House in April of 1961, had frankly connived in a CIA planned effort to overthrow the Castro government with the uh, anti-Castro um, uh, guerrillas landing at the so-called Bay of Pigs, and they suffered a terrible defeat that within a relatively short time, Fidel Castro's forces had either killed or taken prisoner all the men involved. And this was a very great Kennedy and look, made him look uh, very incompetent in the first months of his administration. What Marina recalled was how enraged Lee was by this news of the United States, and in this case, the Kennedy administration, trying to undermine the promise and destroy the, the potential of Castro Cuba. So file that away. So at any rate, this unhappy and uh, soon enough, his uh, unhappiness manifests itself in his determination to return with his wife. And uh, now they have a baby girl to return to the United States and they leave the Soviet Union in the late spring of 1962, meaning that Lee had been there, had lived in the Soviet Union for about two and a half years. And um, some people wonder, does this seem kind of kind of uh, odd or kind of uh, uh, suspicious that the Russians would let him go? I don't think so. I, well, first of all, he was still a U.S. citizen, so that worked in his favor. And uh, also, I think the Soviets said bad news. If he wants to get out of here and he can take his Russian wife with him, we're not going to stand in the way. So anyway, he moves to um, back to the United States with his wife and his child. And uh, by now... Marguerite uh, Oswald has moved to the Dallas area, and it's not too long by the summer of 1962 that Lee uh, and uh, Marina join. Uh, they're there in the Dallas area living uh, close to his mother. Now, let's skip ahead to a key event that occurs in April of 1963. Lee takes a rifle. I'll show it to you in a moment that he had recently acquired in the mail. And on the night of April 10, of 1963, he tries to assassinate a figure who was locally notorious, uh, General Edwin Walker. Walker had been in the United States Army, had been a commander of troops in Germany, but Walker, like Lee, was a political extremist. Lee was a left-wing nut. Walker was a left-wing nut. And because Walker tried to proselytize his own soldiers, which is against the rules of the military, he had been cashiered, he had been booted out. So. Uh, that was big news when it happened, and he came back to the United States and uh, got involved in some very controversial things. By the way, the character of General Walker is the basis for the character in the Stanley Kubrick movie, Dr. Strangelove, General Jack Ripper, who goes uh, off, the, off the reservation and tries to start a nuclear war with the Russians. It's a very dark comedy, a black comedy that came out in 1964. This is the real life Edwin Walker now in civilian clothing. He's here in Oxford, Mississippi in 19, in October of 1962, where there was a, a fight, literal fight. Two people died. Dozens of people were hospitalized and the military had to be called in. President Kennedy had to send in the military. There was a fight over the integration of Ole Miss, a bull to break the color line at that institution. So what I'm trying to get across here is how Lee and Walker were at extreme opposite ends of the political spectrum. And Lee looked at someone like Walker as an enemy that uh, that should be eliminated if at all possible. 
This picture down here is Walker's house in Dallas, and that photograph was taken by Lee Harvey Oswald. It's later found in his possessions after the Kennedy assassination. No one at the time knew what Lee was up to, that on the night of April 10, 1963, he would take a rifle. This, is an attack. this isn't the exact gun right here, but this is a similar newspaper ad from Klein's Sporting Goods in Chicago. Back then you could do this. Here's the actual money order here that is sent to Klein Sporting Goods where he bought this gun here, which is found after President Kennedy was killed on the sixth floor of the school book building being held up by one of the authorities. Here it is, the rifle, and he paid a few dollars extra for a scope that he bought through the mail for $21.45 sent to his P.O. box in Dallas. Notice that the name he used was A. Hedell. A.J. or A. Hedell was a pseudonym that Oswald used on numerous occasions. It's speculative to be sure, but Hedell sort of sounds like Fidel. So I'll just put that out there is for thought. So he had purchased this gun that's, that he's holding here in this picture that Marina took. He's got a pistol here on his hip, so he's wearing black. As he said, he was fully ready to go and hunt some fascist. And he's holding two separate communist newspapers, one Trotskyist, one from the American Communist Party, and he's showing his militants and devotion to the cause. So anyway, he went out that night of April 10, 1963, and saw, see, he, he kind of cased uh, the place. He had planned this. He could see Walker working at his desk, uh, doing some writing, and Lee took a shot, and then he got out of there. And uh, he didn't find out until the next morning when it was on the radio that he had barely missed, that the glass deflected the bullet and that uh, his attempt had been unsuccessful. Marina later said the crime remained unsolved. The police never had a suspect in Dallas. Marina said that when Lee got home that night that he obviously was very agitated. And she said, Lee, what have you done? And he said, I tried to kill Walker. He's a potential American Hitler. He should be eliminated. Think of how much better the world would have been uh, if Hitler had been killed sometime before World War II took place. So the Walker attempt, I think more than anything else is important because it shows us that Lee Harvey Oswald is willing to use violence for political objectives. And for that reason, when you check out a stone, they're not gonna have much, if anything, to say about this episode because I think it is way too revealing. Okay, so uh, the the heat was on. Um, it, was, it was in the news about the attempt. Walker was a notorious figure, and uh, Lee said, let me get out of town. Let's get out of Dodge for a while until uh, till, uh, things just kind of, kind of, uh, till it blows over. And so he uh, moved then uh, for the summer. Uh, the attempt was in April of 1963. Right after that, he moved to New Orleans. He got a job working in a coffee factory there. And in New Orleans, he became active in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a pro-Castro organization that had branches across the United States. We can see here at the in the picture on the top, he's on the street in downtown New Orleans handing out a flyer. It says, hands off Cuba. So what the Fair Play for Cuba Committee was uh, focusing upon was uh, anti-intervention. The United States would once again try to, try to bring down and destroy the Castro government. Here's a local his membership card, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, New Orleans chapter, is Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, you can't make it out very well there. It's kind of faded. But where you have the signature for chapter president, it says A.J. Hedell. They are one and the same guy. It turns out that the New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee had one member, and that was, that was Lee Harvey Oswald. He rented a, a little office, like a broom closet, so that he could say, you know, here's our office address. He, he purchased a rubber stamp and ran off some leaflets and went out there on the street. And he got into a scuffle with some anti-Castro Cubans there in New Orleans. And they came, uh, the police did, and here he is arrested. You see again, kind of his, kind of his stern face, August 9 of 1963, Lee was taken into custody. So there was some newspaper coverage and he had some press clippings and he had some some publicity he had generated about his efforts on the part of the Cuban government. Now, while he's in New Orleans, I think it's very much a key to what happens. This is the New Orleans newspaper, the Times Picayune, ran the story September 9 of 1963, that an American 
journalist in Latin America got an interview with Fidel Castro. And in that interview, Fidel said, U.S. leaders should think that if they are aiding terrorist plans to eliminate Cuban leaders, they themselves will not be safe. And I think we're right to see that. Anyone who is following the news or just reading closely can see that as a veiled threat. So what was this all about? Well, it seems that Fidel had was making the charge or had come to feel that the United States through the CIA was trying to take him out. And, uh, and he was letting it be known, I know what you're up to. Maybe there had been some assassination attempts and some sabotage efforts and this kind of thing. And if you keep doing it, then you're putting yourselves uh, in, the, in the line of harm uh, yourselves. Now, there's no way I can prove it, but given what Lee's habits were, he was an avid reader. He followed the political news intensely. He read daily newspapers. Certainly, there's a good chance Lee would have seen this, and the headline of an interview with Fidel Castro would have leapt out. And Lee, reading this, I think clearly would have, would have come to certain conclusions about what the U.S. was trying to do. Once again, despite our promises in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis of October of 1962, one of the pledges we made in order for the Russians to take the missiles out of Cuba is that we would keep hands off of Fidel Castro. And was there anything to what Castro was claiming, or was it some kind of fantasy? It turns out that Fidel was telling the truth, because we don't find out until the 1970s about the existence of something called a CIA, CIA program called Operation Mongoose, which was, in effect, already covert activities that President Kennedy authorized by the summer of 1963, when Lee is in New Orleans. That's what Fidel is alluding to in the interview, and that's what had been alluded to uh, here in the, in the American press. And so at any rate, it seems that there was indeed the hostility toward the Cuban regime was remained very, very apparent here at this moment in the Cold War. So Lee's in New Orleans when that happens, and not too much longer, this would have been in uh, late September. Um, he left New Orleans on September 25, 1963. He got on a bus, and he took the bus to Mexico City. And this is a very interesting period here of roughly a week when Lee is in the Mexican capital. One of the first things he did, he got a hotel, by the way, it's kind of interesting to check the details. He found a hotel right there in the middle of the city. He paid for the hotel $1.28 a night. I'd like to go to that place and see if it's still there, see what the rate would be. He knew how to live in a very Spartan way, so that was more than, uh, more than sufficient. By the way, Marina, and his daughter, Marina's pregnant now with a second child. They're living, they're back in Dallas at this stage. Anyway, Lee went to the Cuban consulate and what he wanted was to get permission to, he wanted a Cuban visa. And I think clearly what's developed here is Lee has come to believe Cuba's the place to be. Cuba is the ideal setting and he wanted the permission of the Cubans. For various reasons, it couldn't happen. Uh, Lee was told if you go to the Soviet embassy, which is a couple of blocks away, that if they give you a visa uh, that will eventually allow you into the Soviet Union, we'll let you go to Cuba immediately. Otherwise, it's going to take quite some time to get this approved. And Lee went to the Soviet embassy, and the Russians by now had concluded this guy is bad news, and they turned him down. Long story short, Lee was extremely disappointed by his being rebuffed in Mexico City by the Cubans, uh, probably because of the input of the Russians. He had taken his file of his pro-Cuba activities and was convinced that would give his bona fides and would, would uh, get him uh, cheerily admitted, and that didn't happen. Now, a lot of attention's been paid to this interlude here, and I want to say, here's where the music part comes in. That a guy named Chubby Checker had, had a gigantic hit with a song called The Twist in 19... And what it unleashed was kind of a twist craze. And you might remember doing the twist, right? And the Beatles did Twist and Shout, as a matter of fact. They had a big hit recording of that in 1963 in this, in this very year. And one of the guys who did his own twist records uh, was a guy named Bill Haley. Bill Haley and, and, and the Comets, they record a Spanish language a twist album. And uh, so the twist was big south of the too. And uh, so one night during this week that Lee was in Mexico City, he was kind of cooling his heels, uh, hoping that, you know, he could get this, this trip approved. He, he met some people at the, through the Cuban um, consulate, and they invited him to a twist party. And I guess the whole thing would be.
Wait, someone remembered that uh, there were personnel from the from the consulate there, and that one of the Cuban diplomats, in a very loud voice, was saying, and everybody in the room could hear it, what a problem President Kennedy had become and uh, sort of uh, hinting that it would be better if Kennedy weren't around to do that anymore. And I think that's just an intriguing piece of evidence. It's not to suggest that Lee was working for the Cubans or that the Cubans directly put him up to it. It's to suggest that the seed might be planted, that he's already thinking that, that Kennedy's a threat to grow, and, uh, and it'd be better if uh, Castro didn't have to deal with this problem. So anyway, Lee went back, back to the Dallas area now, where his wife is staying, uh, somewhere in here, she gives birth to a second, to another little girl. By now, Marina is living with a woman named Ruth Payne in Irving at this very modest home here out in the suburbs. And uh, Lee is kind of um, doing his usual thing, kind of uh, looking for work. It was hard for him to hold a job because he was a different employee. But at some point, uh, Ruth Payne, knowing that that Lee needed work to try to support his family. Someone down the street knew that there was an opening for a, an order filler at the Texas School Book Depository Building in downtown Dallas, working for minimum wage, but at least that would be something. And that's why, because of Mrs. Payne's uh, connection, that Lee got that job and went to work there on October 16 of 1963. Let's skip ahead to assassination week itself. On the, on the night of Monday, that would have been the 18th of November, President Kennedy gave a major speech in Miami, and it's covered all over the country. Here's the headline of the Miami Daily, but the, the story was also headlined in the Dallas paper, which Lee paid close attention to. In that speech, you can see the major theme. Of course, he's attacking the Republicans. It's political season. Texas trip next for the president, but he's attacking the Reds. He's attacking the communists. And in this speech, he says that Castro, this was a recurring theme, had betrayed his own revolution in that he promised democracy and he uh, on the Cuban people. The next day, the Dallas carried the headline covering, this was Tuesday morning, November the 19th, gave that story the headline, Kennedy, Cuban coup. And on the same front page that Tuesday, below the fold, down on the bottom half, route of the president's motorcade for that Friday. And at that moment, Lee would have known. If you see here, you get, there's Elm Street right there. As a matter of fact, there's the turn from Houston onto Elm and the school book depository building would have been right here. And there it is pictured. And there's the window where Lee was up there on the sixth floor where he was doing some of his work. He knew three days time, the president who's doing all he can to destroy the Castro government is going to come right by his place of work. Now, by now, <coughs> Lee and Marina were separated. They were having some real marital problems because Lee was verbally and physically abusive. And that's another reason she was staying there with her friend, Mrs. Payne. He normally, he had a, a room he rented uh, in Oak Cliff, which is there in Dallas. Just uh, he, Lee, Lee never drove. He used public transportation, so he needed to be close to work. So at any rate, he, he had a rooming house, just a, a room, a small room that he rented, and he would come and stay with Marina and the children on the weekends. Now, it was very, very surprising when he showed up instead of Friday night, as he normally would in Irving, later said that they had a he begged her to come back to him. He said, if you'll come back, I'll get us an apartment. I'll clean up my act, this kind of thing. But Marina refused. Marina turned him down. She said later that she could feel his uneasiness through the night, that it seemed like he barely slept. And in the next morning, he got up and went to work. And only later did she notice that Lee had left in a cup on the dresser practically all the money he had, $170, and his wedding band as well. He never, just like me, there's mine right there, he never took his wedding band off. So she saw that later in the day, and Lee certainly was making um, some kind of dramatic statement. 
Now, that particular Friday morning, he spent Thursday night with Marina. That Friday morning, the man down the street who worked at the same building gave Lee a ride to work because, again, Lee didn't have a car. And he said that when Lee came outside to get in the car, he was carrying under his arm a package wrapped in brown paper. And when that man said to Lee, Lee, what have you got there? He said, I've got some curtain rods and uh, they're going to, I'm going to use them to decorate my apartment to put up some curtains later. It turned out that his room in Oak Cliff had curtains already. So that was his cover story. What was in that brown paper wrapping uh, under his arm was the rifle, which he had taken apart that he was going to take in to work that day. So at any rate, he goes to work and go to the, it's called the sixth floor. That's the museum that's there in Dallas now. It's just an incredibly powerful place to go to. You can't stand in the uh, corner here, the where Lee Harvey Oswald would have been concealed. He stacked up some boxes to use to rest the gun and to provide some concealment. You can stand next to it, though, and look down onto Elm Street. And I think when you can do that, you'll see that for someone who had Marine Corps training, it wasn't that hard a shot. The range would have been about 20 yards. Uh, would have been, excuse me, no, not 20 yards. I, I'm, I misspoke there. Would have been 80 to 100 yards with a four power scope, which he was using though, it would have seemed more like 20 to 25 yards and the motorcade had been forced to slow down. So that's where Lee was and uh, fired the shots and left the building very quickly. Some people had seen somebody in the window. They had a very, very you know general description, white man, medium height, medium build, uh, all points alert out. And a Dallas police officer named J.D. Tippett uh, was there in Oak Cliff. What happened was Lee left the building immediately before the building was locked down. Turned out he was the only employee who could not be accounted for after the assassination. Uh, Dealey Plaza was all gridlocked because of uh, what had just happened. He got on a bus. It didn't go anywhere. He got on a cab. He went back to his, his room in Oak Cliff. He went in and got a jacket and he got his pistol, the pistol that was in that picture. So he was walking down the sidewalk very briskly and Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett sees this man and he fits the general description and pulls over to ask Lee to come to the window to ask him some questions. And Lee shoots and kills right there on the street. And there were at least 10 witnesses in the neighborhood who saw this happen. The police are called out. They swarm into, the, into that area. There's a couple of blocks away, a theater called the, uh, the Texas Theater. And uh, the woman in the ticket booth said that there was a man who went in, he looked very nervous, he didn't buy a ticket, and that's where Lee was. And there was, again, a brief scuffle as he tried to, to get his gun, tried to shoot his gun, but they arrested him. At this point, he's arrested for the murder of Officer Tippett. As soon as they find out, he works at the School Book Depository Building. It's not long before they charge a President Kennedy. So I'll start to, to bring it uh, to close here. Uh, Jack Ruby owned a strip club in a couple of strip clubs in Dallas. Uh, because for respect of the president, they were shut down over the weekend. One of his strippers who lived in Fort Worth needed some money. So that Sunday morning, he drove into downtown Dallas to Western Union to wire her dollars. And that gave him the opportunity, uh, which I do believe was spur of the moment. Uh, security was practically non-existent. He just happened to be down there where Lee was being transferred and he had a pistol. He carried a gun with him because he had owned a nightclub and often carried a lot of cash, and he shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald, and I believe that his explanation does hold up. So there's that, and you know, President Kennedy's assassination hits us so badly because of his youth. Uh, here was, how often do we have a president who has toddlers, who has you know, very, very little children in the Oval Office? And uh, so anyway, it was a stunning uh, loss for the country. Uh, Kennedy was far from a perfect man or a perfect president, but there was a lot of potential and promise there, and this was obviously a very traumatizing event. I gave Claire a list of books that she's going to put on the website, and of all those books, the one I would recommend uh, that's been turned into a Hulu series is this one by Stephen King. Yeah, Stephen King, the writer you, you've all heard of, uh, November 22, 1963. In this case, he has a character, a school teacher in Maine, who knows a guy who has a, here's the Stephen King angle here, a time portal in in in, uh, in a closet in his hamburger cafe. And that time portal allows somebody to go back to, to the time, go back to something like 1960. So the plot involves this man trying, the teacher trying to go back to Dallas to prevent the assassination. And what's really great about it is, if he's gonna prevent it, he's gotta find out who did it in the first place. 
because he doesn't want to he doesn't want to take out the wrong person, somebody who's innocent. So Stephen King uses the story to incorporate all of his own research into the assassination. And in the end, the man concludes, yeah, it was Lee Harvey Oswald, and he's the guy that I need to eliminate so that uh, he changed it. It's about what's called the butterfly effect, because if you were to go back in time, change something as huge as the Kennedy assassination, what else are you gonna change? Okay, so what I'll do is cut it right there. And uh, Claire, I know we just have, it's a few minutes to 11, but I wanna see if we got some questions. And I'm hoping you've been able to hear me this entire time. I've been talking my head off. I hope it's got you. Okay? Yes, anyway, we've heard. Good, good, okay. So Anybody what, what, what has some questions? Some questions yes. If you wanna put it in the chat, you can do that or um, unmute yourself and ask some questions. Yeah, hold forth, I got the chat open here, but it's easier just to talk if you want. So I was just you were going to say something about the jet effect. Yeah, yeah, the jet effect. Okay, so this is this is a horrible detail. When a jet is is the way it, it propels forward, it's through a great expulsion of material out the engine in the rear. So the this would be. of the president's head that's the that's the entry one what you see sort of toward the right front of the head is a massive gaping wound and that's what where you see the explosion in that the headshot frame of the spruder film so the jet effect would mean that the shot actually came from behind the school book depository building when you have the massive expulsion of the president's blood and brain material forward then there is a movement, the opposite reaction is a sudden movement to the back, okay? Which makes it look like to the untrained eye that the bullet came from the front. So that's the jet effect. Um, yeah, and okay. it's again, grizzly Yeah, stuff. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sharon has raised a hand. Sharon, what's your question? Uh, I'd like to know why the documents are still safeguarded, why they have not released all the documents? Well, I think that, you know, uh, we that's, that's a very good question because it allows me to elaborate a little bit more on something else. I don't think there's any more that's there. We've got all we need far and away. There could be some stuff still off limits for sensitivities of the Kennedy family. It's not exactly a document, but one thing that we can't look at now is Mrs. Kennedy's clothing that day. It's, it's, it, I'm sorry, you're you're cutting out. The clothing, this is Kennedy's clothing, right? It's not going to be visible to the public for something like another hundred years. And so I think there could be some things like that that are kept off limits for some reasons of sensitivity. Now, a couple of years ago, you may have heard President Trump released some documents. There was a so-called documents dump, and there was some, you know, attention paid. I think the most important thing that came out of those documents, we know a little bit more about how our government reacted to the crucial days when Oswald visited Mexico City. I think if there's anything to the idea that there was a cover up in the case of the Kennedy assassin, it was the CIA and the FBI that were so embarrassed after the fact that they weren't watching this guy more closely because they knew he was there in Mexico City, that he had visited the Cuban consulate and the Soviet embassy. They knew he had lived in the Soviet Union for two and a half years. They should have been watching this guy closely when the president came to Dallas. So I think in those documents, there was a little more information on that, but even that's not really new. We basically knew this stuff already. So be careful of the idea that there's something out there that's still hidden. It's, it's kind of like, I'd say the OJ case, guys. There's already a mountain of evidence that in my mind establishes Oswald's guilt. And there's just not a shred of evidence, on the other hand, real conspiracy was behind this. So that's what I say about the documents. So all the Warren Commission documents have been released to the public? Well, I don't know about that. If everything has been, God knows the Warren Commission reports 20-something volumes. Uh, there's a lot that's already there. I mean, is there anything that's still, I, I just don't know. Um, 
put their well, that, that's what I'm referring to. That's what I'm yeah. referring to. I'm not talking about Mrs. Kennedy's clothes. I'm talking yeah. about written documents that, for okay. some reason, are still sealed, and 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 not. You know, there could be, but uh, and that's really all I can say. There could be. Uh -huh. but, um, I still don't think that's gonna. I'll have to say that I don't believe that's gonna change a thing. If there's anything okay. we haven't seen yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Very yes. interesting. Okay. Well, yes. Yes, Steve. Very and well said. I mean, just so engaging, and I really. And I, ha I have read Stephen King's book, but I'm going to have to check out the Hulu series. I didn't know. Yeah. That, it, that sounds great. Very good. I recommend it to my students. And, you know, um, I don't get Hulu. So I, I, I used to get DVDs uh, from Netflix through the mail. And I watched it by doing that. It's really good. And, um, it, and it, you know, again, the thing that I tell my students about, it kind of creates years ago practically uh one of the things that happens is the teacher when he goes back in time he has a cell phone and he realizes i got to get rid of this they're going to know there's something really <laughs> weird about me and there's a scene where he's being interviewed by a principal for a job at a local high school and the principal uh says would you like some coffee and he gets up to go get some coffee not knowing that back then secretaries would go get the coffee for the men <laughs> right but things like that it was a different world and i think stephen king is a genius that kind of recaptures um, you know, again, the way things used to be. Wow. Anyway. So anything else, guys, anybody mad at? <laughs> did you storm out? Nobody stormed out. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see what they did. So I think I said, uh, and, and check, uh, Claire, would you tell them where you put the bibliography that I sent you so they can look at that? Yes, on the, on the, on the life homepage, I put the, oh, I'll put this, this, presentation. I'll include the, the, ha the handout. It's also there now if you want to go to it. And I will send an email out to everybody and I'll include that as well. It's a really interesting, Steve, I really, I looked at mm -hmm. your bibliography. It looks uh -huh. really interesting. The, yeah, um, unfortunately, some of the stuff the library doesn't have. So. That's okay. I mean, I did put some conspiracy uh, theory books on some of the major arguments, even though that's not my point of view. And as you know, and this goes back to the woman who asked the question about the documents, there are people who devote their lives to this stuff. And uh, so, you know, that those books, those, I don't know how many I put on there, um, probably, you know, 15 or so, that's just a mere fraction of the books that are out there. But I thought these are, these are the ones I would really recommend for further reading the subject. And some of them were novels, which is interesting, including, yeah. of course, the Stephen King. Yeah, it's always fun to yeah, absolutely. see a take on that. I think. I think our, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And okay. I'm yeah, I'm, we, I we just it, cut out, Steve. I, Oh, did we? Okay. Yes, well, thank I, you so much. Okay, I enjoyed it, and uh, so <laughs> we'll talk later, okay? Thank you, Steve. It was great. My, my final life program, it was, a, it was a super, super success. Thank you so much. And I, bye, everybody. Oh.